I used to own a home in West Virginia when my family lived there. And when it came time to move to Arkansas for me to begin my work at Harding, of course we had to sell our house. So we put it on the market and we got a real estate agent. And uh, one day our real estate agent called us and said, okay, I've got some people who want to come by and see your house. They'll be there in about 35 minutes. Preheat your oven and put some cookies in the oven right now. And I, I said, uh, why do I have to feed them cookies? And she said, no, you don't understand. When people come and look at a house, if they smell the aroma of baked goods in the house, if they, if they smell the aroma of cookies, it feels like home. It has this psychological effect on them. It makes them want to be there. It makes them more predisposed to seriously consider buying your place. So put some cookies in the oven now. Uh, I just never expected to hear my real estate agent say that to me. That was not the kind of advice that I expected to get from her. But, uh, but it makes sense, doesn't it, when you think about it. The aromas of home, you, probably, you can probably think of some, can't you? You can probably think of certain smells that are nostalgic for you. Certain smells that remind you of home. Those are the smells that draw us in. Those are the smells that make us want to be at a certain place. Uh, the smell of a home-cooked meal on the oven. The smell of a pie baking. Those aromas have a powerful psychological effect on us and they seem to prepare us to, to relate to people in a very intimate way. It makes us think of family. It makes us think of the, of the joy of sharing a meal together and, and all of life that uh, becomes connected around a table. That, that came to me as I was looking at the book of Leviticus, particularly the section dealing with sacrifice, because there is this refrain in Leviticus 1 through 9, Remember we were talking yesterday about the drumbeat of Leviticus. Remember we were talking about that. And what, what is the drumbeat of Leviticus? Do you remember? Be holy for I am holy. Well, there's also a drumbeat that characterizes chapters 1 through, one through 9, which deals primarily with the sacrificial system and with the ordination of the priests. And the drumbeat is... It is a pleasing aroma to the Lord. Over and over again, you hear these sacrifices being described in these terms. It is a pleasing aroma to the Lord. The, the smell of the sacrifice going up in smoke, the smell of the sacrifice burning on the altar was a, a, a smell that attracted God to Israel's camp. That let him know that Israel desired his communion, desired his presence and invited him to come and to commune with them in an intimate way as a member of their family, you see. Now, I want to begin not in Leviticus this morning, but in a passage that is probably more familiar to you, actually three passages, because this, this idea of aroma, this idea of a pleasing odor to the Lord, finds expression in a number of Paul's writings. And I'm very intrigued by what Paul does with this idea. And then I want to raise the question of where does this come from? Where does Paul get this idea? The most famous text for this is 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 15. Um, kind of out of nowhere, Paul begins to praise God for leading him in triumphal procession. And in the course of that, he says, we are the aroma of Christ to God among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. Now, Paul here is using the image of a defeated captive being led in a procession uh, before a jeering crowd. The image, you would think, would be one of humiliation. But Paul actually praises God that he gets to be a captive led by God in triumphal procession. 
Because everything is reversed in Christianity, isn't it? What appears to be defeat is in fact victory. Right? We've learned this from the cross, right? It's just when Jesus appears to be defeated that he gains his greatest victory for himself and us. Isn't that right? And so Paul uses that same kind of reversal here in this text when he praises God for the fact that he gets to sacrifice his life in the service of the gospel. For Paul, nothing could be greater. It gives his life meaning. It's in that context that he says, we are the aroma of Christ to God among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. So Paul makes the point that when we, when we devote our lives to God's service, when we sacrifice ourselves in the service of the gospel, it creates a distinctive odor. It creates an aroma that God finds immensely pleasurable. And that attracts him to commune with us. That lets him know that we desire his presence and his fellowship. And so we let off that aroma when we offer ourselves without reservation for his service, for his purposes, whatever it may be, whatever the cost may be. When God sees us abandon ourselves like that to his purposes, it creates an immense pleasure in him. And he communes with us and dwells with us. We find it again in Ephesians chapter 5 verses 1 and 2 where Paul is reflecting on the work of Christ. And he says in this one, Therefore be imitators of God as beloved children and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. When Jesus gave himself up for our behalf, he let off an odor. He created an aroma that the Father immediately noticed that pleased the Father. It was that fragrant offering. And God was favorably disposed towards us because of the aroma of Christ because of the smell of his total dedication. And then uh, at the very end of the letter to the Philippians, Paul, in gratitude for a, a rather large financial gift that they have contributed to him, he makes this statement. I have received full payment and more. I am well supplied, having received from Epaphroditus the gifts you sent, a fragrant offering, a sacrifice pleasing and acceptable to God. Now, I'm just intrigued by that language. I'm intrigued by that imagery, that notion of all, in all of these sacrificial contexts, in all of these contexts where Paul is describing uh, self-giving, a, a selfless kind of service for God. He uses the language of sacrifice and he uses the language of the aroma of Christ. And I wonder where that comes from. Why did it occur to Paul to describe these acts of service in this way? Because, you know, when I think of an act of service, I don't associate any particular smell with it, do you? Well, maybe certain acts of service. Uh, there are certain rigorous acts of service that I suppose do let off their own distinctive odor. But, you know, in general, I don't think of uh, Christian service as having a distinctive odor. But that's precisely the way Paul describes it in these contexts. And he refers to it as a pleasant odor, an odor that, that God enjoys. Well, it'll, it'll be no surprise to you, given the, the theme for this week, what I'm about to say. That this idea, this language of a pleasing aroma to God comes from, guess where? You've got it, church. Leviticus, that's right. So once again, we see how that the, these concepts, these ideas in a book that, that we're not all that excited about, that we're not particularly drawn to, they were actually quite important to Paul. Uh, they filled his mind with images that he attached to significant acts of Christian service that he considered to be sacrificial in nature, that he considered to be heroic. They let off an odor. And the odor was the very same odor that we read about 
when we come to the book of Leviticus and we are introduced to the sacrificial system that God prescribed for Israel. Now, like I said before, there's a drumbeat throughout these nine chapters of Leviticus that are preoccupied with the idea of sacrifice. And you can see just how frequently the phrase occurs. And we won't necessarily look at all of these, but just so that you can hear what it sounds like, let's look at a few of them. Leviticus chapter 1, for example, verse 9. This is in the midst of instructions given to precisely how the sacrifice should be offered. This is, but its entrails and its legs he shall wash with water, and the priest shall burn all of it on the altar as a burnt offering, a food offering with a pleasing aroma to Yahweh. Did you hear it? A what? A pleasing aroma to Yahweh. And then again in verse 13 and again in verse 17, with regard to the same sacrifice, it's repeated. This is a whole burnt offering. It is a pleasing aroma to Yahweh. Then we find it again in chapter 2, verse 2, in reference to the grain offering. There we hear it said, And bring it to Aaron's sons, the priest, and he shall take from it a handful of fine flour and oil with all of its frankincense, and the priest shall burn this as its memorial portion on the altar, a food offering with a pleasing aroma to Yahweh. So the sacrifice emits an odor that God enjoys and that invites his presence into Israel's midst that encourages him to continue dwelling in their midst and communing with them. And uh, the same thing is said of several of the other sacrifices as you can see from the other verses listed there. So this is the drumbeat of Leviticus 1-9. through 9, This idea of a pleasing aroma to the Lord. And it's something that Paul picks up on and applies to the Christian service that you and I render to God. That too has that same effect, has that same aroma as Leviticus describes with respect to these sacrifices. So what, what do we learn from the repetition of this phrase? What does this suggest to us about uh, what these chapters are all about and what the sacrificial system accomplished in the life of Israel and in her relationship with God? Well, one of the first things that seems clear is that this statement regarding the, the fragrance of the sacrifice and the effect that it had on God would indicate that these sacrifices had an appeasing and atoning effect on God. They appeased God's wrath that was provoked by Israel's sin. And it encouraged God to set aside His wrath and to instead extend to Israel his love and his grace and his mercy. So that was an effect that we see the sacrificial system have on God by virtue of this aroma that, that rises to him. But you may be thinking, and, and I think it's a very reasonable question, a very reasonable thought. It certainly has occurred to me as well. This seems an odd way to talk about God, doesn't it? Does God actually have a nose? <laughs> Does he have olfactory senses? Well, of course, you, we must understand that whenever the Bible speaks of God, it, it has to speak of him somewhat metaphorically, right? Uh, we, we, we sometimes call this an anthropomorphism. What it means is that God is being presented as having human qualities, even though we know he doesn't, just so that we can relate to him just so we can understand that something is transpiring here in our relationship with God. But what is it about the smell of sacrifice, the odor of burning flesh and meat, that Yahweh finds so appealing? I think this is why this book strikes us as odd or bizarre. It's because these are, these are not the kinds of things we would normally think of as presenting necessarily a pleasant odor. But I think the reason why it's described this way in the book of Leviticus and why it has this kind of effect on God is because from God's point of view, this is the smell of communion and fellowship. God loves it when his people desire his presence and when they express that desire in sacrifice. Let me give you an example that I think you'll be able to relate to. I don't know about you, but any time I smell someone barbecuing in his backyard, 
I pick up my nose and I, I take a, a, a good inhale of that. I, take a, I love that smell. Isn't that a great smell? The smell of someone barbecuing in his backyard. And I don't know what kinds of things come to your mind when you smell that. But I immediately think of family reunions. Of young blood family reunions. Because we love to barbecue. Now you have to understand, my relatives live in West Kentucky. And, in, uh, and a lot of them live in West Tennessee. And that part of the United States is famous for, guess what? Really good barbecue. So for that reason, our family reunions were characterized by that smell, by that odor of steaks and hamburgers and hot dogs and chicken breasts sitting on a grill and sizzling and letting off that delicious aroma of perfectly cooked meat. Now you know the smell, right? You, and, you, and you perhaps have some of your own associations. But that smell for me says family. It says, welcome home. It says, I've missed you. I'm so glad to see you. Let's eat. Let's eat together. And meals have that kind of significance, don't they? That's what I think attracts Yahweh to that odor. This is, this is Israel saying to Yahweh, we want you in our midst. We long for your presence. We hunger to have you near us. And what says that? What communicates that? It's this odor that reminded both Israel and Yahweh of the significance of sharing a meal and of all that that symbolized and of all that that enacted. Because when you share a meal with someone, you deepen your relationship with them. Isn't that right? All right, well, let's back up a little bit and let's talk a little bit about the origins of sacrifice. Because Leviticus assumes that sacrifice would, of course, be a part of Israel's worship. Uh, we probably wouldn't make that assumption. But when you think about it, sacrifice goes back as far as we can tell. Uh, and it's quite universal. It seems regardless of culture, regardless of religion, Sacrifice has always played a fundamental role in the way human beings have attempted to relate to the divine. And so this is, a, this is a very universal expression of worship. And so it was a very convenient way for God to communicate certain things to Israel, and so he adopted it for them as well. Israel would have readily recognized and understood the significance of sacrifices, such as the ones that we read about in Leviticus. Uh, we know that similar sacrifices were offered uh, in Syria to the north, in Ugarit. We know that similar sacrifices were offered in Assyria, in Babylon. This was, this was very common. Now, there, there were some distinctive things about the way Israel implemented sacrifice, and we'll talk about that in a minute. But to begin with, just, just know that this was just part of their world. This was an, an assumption, and that's, that's one reason why we don't often get a lot of explanation for it. But within the Bible itself, there are some clear hints as to the significance or the origin of animal sacrifice. I suppose one of the first places where this becomes significant, prominent, important is in Genesis chapter 3, verse 21. Now you'll recognize that this is the chapter that narrates the sin of Adam and Eve and the fallout, the consequences that come as a result of their disobedience to God. Do you remember what happened the moment that Adam and Eve partook of that fruit? The text tells us that, quote, their eyes were opened and they realized that they were naked. That's always struck me as odd. How could you not know that you were naked? I mean, and especially how could Adam not have noticed that Eve was naked? I don't think I'd miss that, right? No, but I think you have to understand the point that the text is making here is not, is not that you know, they were oblivious to their state. I think what it means is, is that the moment they sinned, they became self-conscious. Sin makes us self-conscious. When we sin, we all of a sudden turn inward and we become very concerned, who knows, 
Or what if I'm found out? And all of a sudden, most of our energies and our mental attention are diverted from being other-centered to being self-centered. I suppose the reason why it had never occurred to Adam that he was naked was that he was far too focused on Eve. He was other-centered, and this is the way God had wanted it to be. But upon eating that fruit, Adam becomes self-conscious, self-aware in a way he wasn't before because that's what sin does to us. It turns our attention back on ourselves. Now, when they realize this, they suddenly become quite shy and feel the need to hide from each other as well as from God. They try to cover themselves. And if you remember, the means by which they tried to cover themselves were fig leaves. I would not recommend this. I am not a proponent of fig leaf underwear. I can't imagine that that would be comfortable in any sense. Uh, so I think in, in two ways, this demonstrates the inadequacy of all human solutions to sin. All human solutions to cover our own nakedness are inadequate in two ways. First of all, they don't cover the material adequately. And number two, they are not comfortable. All right? So this is, this is the pathetic attempt of Adam and Eve to try to deal with a sin issue that they cannot deal with on their own. To cover a shame that is too much for them. And so they, they are ridiculously standing there in, in fig leaf underwear. And God comes. And in Genesis chapter 3 verse 21, look at what it says. God relieves them of the discomfort and exposure of their own attempt to cover their sin. And it says this, beginning in verse uh, 22 of Genesis 3. Then Yahweh God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us in knowing good and evil. Now, let us re uh, now lest he reach out his hand and take also the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore Yahweh God sent him out from the Garden of Eden to work the ground from which he was taken. He drove out the man, and at the east of the Garden of Eden, he placed the cherubim and a flaming sword that turned every way, the way to the tree of life. Now, I missed, I missed it there somewhere. Oh, it was the, above that. I'm sorry. Yes. The man called his wife's name Eve because she was the mother of all living. And Yahweh God made for Adam and for his wife garments of skins and clothed them. All right. So God replaces this obviously uncomfortable and inadequate covering of fig leaves with animal skin. And so what we discover here is that pretty clearly what God had to do to cover Adam and Eve's sin required what? The death of an animal. And then the skinning of it and then its skin was used to cover their nakedness. I think this was a concept in Israel that began to resonate with them that sin results in the death either of the sinner or of an innocent victim who must die in the sinner's place so that the sin can be covered, so that the shame can be dealt with, you see? And so this concept then kind of emerges out of what happens in Genesis 3.21 and sets a precedent that eventually leads to the full-fledged sacrificial system that we read about in Leviticus. So the animal provides a covering for Adam's, Adam and Eve's shame and their vulnerability, which is symbolized by their nakedness. And that's ultimately what the goal of the sacrificial system will be. Then from this point on, sacrifice becomes quite regular and quite expected. We see it again in the story of Cain and Abel. We know that they offer sacrifices. And then we see it again in the flood story, where at the conclusion of the flood, we have Noah offering sacrifices. Now, what's interesting about this particular instance is additional details that we've not read before. For example, at the end of the flood, all of a sudden, a distinction is being made between clean and unclean animals. Now, this is kind of odd because no such distinction has yet been made in the biblical text. It doesn't come until Leviticus. But already in the flood, Noah is making these distinctions. So that's interesting, isn't it? How that Leviticus is being anticipated in certain ways by what precedes it. It's also interesting that in relation to the offering that Noah 
sacrifices to God at the conclusion of the flood, we have this familiar language of a pleasing aroma, which we've already seen is so common in Leviticus 1 through 7. So there's a couple of things that are put into place uh, in um, Genesis 9, Genesis 8, that prepare us for the sacrificial system in Leviticus. But if we're really going to appreciate what's going on here in these bizarre rituals and these detailed instructions regarding sacrifices, where the place to start is with the meaning of sacrifice. What precisely was it that God was trying to communicate to his people through these rituals? What was it he was trying to accomplish? So I want to share with you some ideas, some thoughts about how Israel understood the sacrificial system. Now, as was common in the ancient world, sacrifice was understood to be an offering of food to a deity. So that's the basic assumption is that when you're offering a sacrifice, what you're doing is you are offering food to the God and presumably the God consumes it, the God eats it. That is the idea. Now, that would seem a very strange thing for Israel to assume with regard to Yahweh, but that seems to be the case because you'll notice that the sacrifices in Leviticus are consistently referred to as a food offering for Yahweh. So this is an important basic concept if we're going to understand what's going on with respect to sacrifice and the way it defines Israel's relationship with God. Now, uh, just to give you an example of what I mean and why I think this is important and foundational. Just look at what it says in Leviticus 1.9. But its entrails and its legs he shall wash with water, and the priest shall burn all of it on the altar as a burnt offering, a food offering with a pleasing aroma to Yahweh. A food offering. That's what the whole burnt offering is. Now, it's particularly significant with regard to this offering because nobody else eats any of this offering. The whole burnt offering is unique in the sense that it is completely consumed on the fire. None of it is left over for the priest to eat, and none of it is left over for the worshiper or other members of the community to eat. That's unusual because with most other sacrifices, there is a portion set aside for the priest. That's their pay for rendering their service. And there is, in, in at least one sacrifice, a portion also left aside for the worshiper and others that the worshiper might invite to come and eat with him with regard to his sacrifice. But the whole burnt offering is not like that. Unlike all the other sacrifices, this one is given entirely to God. So in what sense is it a food offering? Who's eating it? Well, you would have to conclude it must be God. And of course, Malachi chapter 1 verse 7 uses this same kind of idea as, as Yahweh gets on Judah's case for inferior sacrifices. And uh, you're probably familiar with this text, but I want you to notice in particular the way God talks about sacrifice. Malachi chapter 1 verse 7. I'm going to begin in verse 6. It says, A son honors his father, and a servant his master. If then I am a father, where is my honor? And if I am a master, where is my fear? Says Yahweh of hosts, to you, O priest, who despise my name. But you say, how have we despised your name? Now look at what it says in verse 7. By offering polluted food upon my altar. But you say, how have we polluted you? By saying that the Lord's table may be despised. You see that? Notice how that altar and table are interchangeable, aren't they? Yahweh's altar is Yahweh's table. And Yahweh does not appreciate it when polluted food is offered on his table. So it seems pretty clear, doesn't it, that we have this concept of the sacrifice being food. Now, let me, at this point, it's important to realize that there's, an, there's a, a significant distinction that must be made between the way Israel's neighbors thought about this and the way Israel did. You see, Israel's neighbors believed that the gods actually depended on the sacrifices for nourishment. That the gods ate the sacrifices because they had to. They needed to be sustained just like any human would. They required food for their existence. This was not Israel's understanding. Israel was not making the same assumption about God. Because God taught Israel 
that he did not eat their sacrifices out of necessity. He ate them out of a desire for communion. Do you understand the difference? See, sometimes I think we make the mistake of, of assuming that because God doesn't have to eat, he doesn't eat. Since he doesn't need it, since he's not dependent on it, he doesn't participate in meals. But you're going to find out that's not the case. God loves a good meal. And he shares it with his people as a way of saying, I accept you into my family. I love you. I provide this for you and I share it with you as a way of connecting and relating to you. So uh, let me give you a, a passage where you can see that God is very clear about the fact that he is not dependent on Israel's sacrifices, that that's not the purpose behind his eating with them at the altar. A good place to go is Psalm 50. In Psalm 50, verses 12 through 15, we read these words. God speaking to Israel says, If I were hungry, I would not tell you. For the world in its fullness are mine. Do I eat the flesh of bulls or drink the blood of goats? Offer to God a sacrifice of thanksgiving and perform your vows to the Most High. And call upon me in the day of trouble. I will deliver you and you shall glorify me. You see See, Israel was, was just as susceptible as many of her neighbors into thinking that God was somehow dependent on her sacrifices, that he needed them for his nourishment. God says, no, 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 that's not the case. If I were hungry, I wouldn't tell you. I would take care of myself. The, the cattle on a thousand hills belongs to me, right? He doesn't need Israel to supply him for food. So Israel's understanding was different in that regard. Nonetheless, Despite the fact that God doesn't have to eat or participate in meals, there's plenty of evidence in Scripture that he chooses to do so for the sake of communicating to us his desire for communion and to make us feel accepted into his family, adopted by him, as it were, so that we have a place at his table. So uh, Exodus 24, verse 5 and verses 9 through 11 gives us a good example of this. We read here, And he sent young men of the people of Israel who offered burnt offerings and sacrificed peace offerings of oxen to Yahweh. And Moses took half of the blood and put it in basins, and half of the blood he threw against the altar. Then we jump down a little bit further to verse 9, and it says, Then Moses and Aaron, Nadab and Abihu, and 70 of the elders of Israel went up, and they saw the God of Israel. There was under his feet, as it were, a pavement of sapphire stone, like the very heaven for clearness. And he did not lay his hand on the chief men of the people of Israel. They beheld God, and they ate, and they drank. God invited Moses and Aaron, Nadab and Abihu, and, and the elders of Israel to come up to the midpoint on Mount Sinai. And to join with him in a communal meal, a covenant meal that would ratify the covenant that he had just made with them. That would communicate to them how serious he is about relating to you and me. About making us part of his family. And, and what says family more than being at the table and sharing the food, right? Right? Now that's actually an image, a symbol that has survived all the way into the New Covenant, isn't it? Because God still sets a table for His sons and daughters every Sunday. God still says, come eat with me. God still promises to meet us there so that we can know that we are accepted, that we belong to a family, that we're part of a community, and that we are responsible for bearing the family likeness of His love and His holiness. Isn't that right, church? You get to eat with God. Just like they did. Except it's even better. Because this time, He's revealed Himself to us in Jesus Christ. And we know that it's His table that we eat at. And it's with Him that we commune. I'll have more to say about the Lord's Supper in a minute as we 
wrap up and talk about the implications of all of this for Christian practice today and how it connects with the Lord's Supper. But uh, you can see this is a very important concept, the notion that sacrifice is to be thought of as food, that God shares with his people as a way of indicating his intimate fellowship with them. Now, of course, when we, when we look at these texts, there are there's some things we want to keep in mind. First of all, Obviously, God does not literally eat the sacrifice, right? This is imagery that God is using in order to communicate to Israel that he desires to commune with them, that he desires intimacy with them. So naturally, God is not literally eating the sacrifice, but this is the imagery he chooses to use to tell Israel, I am one of you. I have invited you to be part of my family. So the sacrifice becomes symbolic of a communal meal. Now, the next thing you'll notice is that as you read through Leviticus and other texts where sacrifices are being offered, the elements of a sacrifice are equivalent to the elements of a typical meal. There are three basic elements involved in sacrifice. There is, of course, meat. There is grain. And there is wine. So you have drink offerings, you have cereal offerings, and then you have, of course, animal sacrifices, which constitute meat. Now, when you put all that together, what do you have? You have a meal, but let me be clear about this. This is no ordinary meal. Unlike our diet in which meat is served at every meal, that was not the case in Israel. Meat was a luxury item. Meat was saved for special occasions. When there is a festival, when there is something to celebrate, when when something significant was being commemorated, that's when they ate meat, you see. But any time God is present at the table, that's a festival. I guess you could say God is the life of the party. And when he shows up, he says, we're going to have meat. Get ready for this. Hold on to your seats. And we're going to have wine. Right? Right? And that's what they did. They would pour wine out next to the altar as they offered the sacrifice. And the sacrifice would often be accompanied on the top with bread, with a cereal offering, right? I mean, we, we've got to have bread, right? I don't know about you, but I want to roll. All right, I want to roll. And God says, we're going to have rolls. We're going to have rolls, unleavened, but we're going to have them. Right? We're going to have rolls. We're going to have meat. We're going to have wine. We are going to celebrate because we are a family and something remarkable has happened and what I've just done to, to rescue you from Egypt and to dwell in your midst and it is to be commemorated and it is to be celebrated that we are we are making a way to be together despite the barriers of sin and holiness and we're going to accomplish it through sacrifice you see now I, I hope that this gives you a little bit of a different perspective on all of this because when you read these texts it's like <laughs> it's, like, um, it, it's, it's good for insomnia, right? But if you, if you have the bigger picture, if you understand the, the greater significance of it, there's, there's something to be cherished there about the way this, this works out. Now, let me talk about another basic assumption behind the sacrificial system as we try to understand it and grasp its significance. And that is, you have to understand the, the, the holiness correlations that Israel understood, that, that Israel assumed. There are three basic categories, each of which can be divided into three subsets. One category is animals, another category is people, and the third category is spaces. And in all three cases, God divided these categories into three subsets. So starting with animals, animals could be holy, they could be clean, or they could be unclean. It's very important to realize that there are three categories here and not just two. Animals were not just clean or unclean, they were wholly clean or unclean. And let me explain the difference. A holy animal is the kind of animal that is suitable for sacrifice. In other words, it's the kind of animal God can eat. 
A clean animal is the kind of animal that is suitable for Israel's food. It's the kind of animal that Israel could eat. And an unclean animal is prohibited. Israel can't eat it, and Israel certainly can't offer it as a sacrifice, right? Do you see how that works? So those are the categories. So you'll notice that in, in most of these, in every one of these sacrifices, the requirement is that the sacrifice being offered be a male without blemish or defect, right? It has to be perfect. It has to be holy, you see. And this, of course, is one of the things that, it, that excites God's anger in the book of Malachi is they're bringing offerings to the altar that are what? Blind, lame, subpar. And they're attempting to give this to God as a sacrifice. And he won't, he won't accept it because it's not holy. Now, those animals were clean. Israel could have eaten them. But they were not holy, and therefore they could not be sacrificed. you see the difference? All right. Now, that same breakdown that occurs in the animal category also occurs in the people category, the human category. You have three kinds of people in Israel, right? Or three kinds of people from the Israelite point of view. You have holy people who are the priests. They have a special relationship to holy things and to God. Then you have clean people, that is Israel, who is allowed to be in relationship with God. And then you have, of course, unclean people, the nations, who are outside of the covenant community. Right? So the same three subsets that you have with animals, you have with people. And then, of course, as we learned yesterday, the very same thing holds true with space. You have holy space, which would be the sanctuary, right, the tabernacle. You have clean space, which would be the Israelite camp, or later, the land of Canaan. And then, of course, you have unclean space, which is the world outside of Israel's borders. You see how it works? So all of Israel's worldview is based on this grid. It's based on this understanding that whether we're talking about animals or people or spaces, they can be holy, they can be clean, or they can be unclean. All right? So this underlies a lot of the thinking behind the sacrificial system as well. And so, of course, when you're moving in this direction, you're moving in the direction of sanctification or holiness. And when you're moving in this direction, you're moving in the direction of defilement. So it is a moving scale. All right. Let's talk about some further basic assumptions of the sacrificial system that we haven't covered yet. The, the big ones are in place, but here are a few others that we should keep in mind. A very important principle in the book of Leviticus, and I would say in the New Testament as well, is expressed in Leviticus chapter 17, verses 10 through 12. So if you want to turn there with me, let's read it together. Leviticus chapter 17, beginning in verse 10. God says, If any one of the house of Israel or of the strangers who sojourn among them eats any blood, I will set my face against that person who eats blood and will cut him off from among his people. For the life of the flesh is in the blood. And I have given it for you on the altar to make atonement for your souls. For it is the blood that makes atonement by the life. Therefore, I have said to the people of Israel, no person among you shall eat blood, neither shall any stranger who sojourns among you eat blood. So in Israel, there was a, there was a prohibition against eating any meat that still had the blood in it. You were prohibited from eating meat with blood or eating blood of any kind. The reason for that was that the blood served a special purpose. Uh, Blood was to be considered by Israel a very precious commodity because the blood was associated very directly with life. And life was not to be treated lightly in Israel. Israel was not to behave as though she could simply consume life, as though it were cheap, or as though it were intended to serve her purposes, you see. Blood communicated life and it was reserved for this one purpose. If blood was to be shed, the only really legitimate reason for shedding it was to make atonement. And so that's what blood was for. 
and it was to be off limits for anyone else for any other purposes, you see? So that's a basic assumption of the sacrificial system. This is why the blood is caught in a, in a basin. You, did you, have you noticed when you read the sacrificial procedure, when the sacrificial animal is slaughtered, its blood is caught in a basin and the blood is dashed against the altar. So there is a ritual for the blood that secures the atonement in the sacrificial process. A second basic assumption of the sacrificial system is that the animal world mirrors the human world. This is a very important assumption and it's probably one you could have gathered from the chart I showed you just a moment ago that showed the, the correlations between space, people, and animals, which can all be subdivided into holy, clean, and unclean. But I want you to look with me for a moment at Leviticus chapter 20, verses 24 through 26, where God makes this clear. And I think you'll find this to be a fascinating passage because it explains, it explains a lot of things. But listen to what God says here in Leviticus chapter 20, beginning in verse 24. He says, but I have said to you, you shall inherit the land and I will give it to you to possess a land flowing with milk and honey. I am Yahweh, your God, who has separated you from the peoples. You shall therefore separate the clean beast from the unclean and the unclean bird from the clean. You shall not make yourselves detestable by beast or by bird or by anything with which the ground crawls, which I have set apart for you to hold unclean. You shall be holy to me, for I, Yahweh, am holy, and have separated you from the peoples that you should be mine. I want you to notice the structure of these verses for just a moment, okay? Think about this with me. God's first statement is, I have separated you from the nations, right? He says, therefore, you are to make a distinction between clean animals and unclean animals. And then he says, what again? Because I have separated you from the nations. What's the connection? You see, what God is saying here is that the clean and unclean animals are symbolic. They're symbolic of the separation I've made between you and the nations. You are to make these distinctions as a constant reminder that I have set you apart from the nations to be different, to belong to me in a special way. And you're going to commemorate that by your diet. Every day, you're going to have to be thoughtful about the fact that certain animals are clean and others are unclean, and that's going to remind you of a distinction that I have made between you and the nations. So that connection is made very clearly in Leviticus 20, isn't it? So there's a very close association between the animal world and the human world in the Israelite mind. Now, this might explain why, in Acts chapter 10, when God is ready to launch the Gentile mission, and he chooses Peter to be the first to cross that boundary, that he communicates it by what means? By a vision of a sheet descending from heaven with what in it? All kinds of animals, clean and unclean, all mixed together. And he says to Peter what? Rise, Peter, kill and eat. And Peter says, oh no, you're, you're tricking me, God. You're testing me. I have never eaten anything that was common or unclean. That association, of course, was intended to let Peter know that the time had come to open the doors to the Gentiles because of that correlation that was already established in Leviticus. You see, that makes sense now, doesn't it? That's why that vision occurred. But the reason why this is important, it says... Um, the reason why this correlation between the animal world and the human world is important is because of the, the, the basic assumption that the worshiper identifies himself with the animal that he offers so that the animal can be a substitute for him, right? One of the things you'll notice that the worshiper is always required to do when he presents his animal in the tent of meeting is he's required to place his hand on the animal's head and to press down. This is a way of saying... This animal is mine, and I'm offering it to represent me on the altar. It's really a way of the Israelites saying, I am the one who should be dying, but by the grace of God, 
I'm offering my animal in my place. Because God has said he would accept it. Do you see? So that the, the placement of the hand upon the head of the animal, the pressing upon it was a way of saying, this is my animal and I'm offering it in my stead. Does that make sense? And so this correlation between the animal and human world makes that possible, makes possible that kind of substitution. And that substitution is assumed in the sacrificial system. As we've already said, the sacrificial system also assumes that God is appeased by sacrifice, that it is a soothing aroma, that sacrifice has a propitiatory effect. Now, what, what propitiation means is simply this. It turns away God's wrath so that we can experience instead his love and his fellowship. Now, I think this is, this is an important point to dwell on for just a moment because uh, currently in theology, in Old Testament studies, it's very unpopular to suggest that God is wrathful or to, say, or to suggest that his wrath needs to be appeased. And so many have kind of dismissed that idea as being primitive or beneath Israel to think such a thing. But I've got to tell you, uh, I don't agree with them. And I think that if we dismiss the wrath of God, we are losing a lot more than we think, than we realize. And let, let me explain why I, why I think this is the case. Sacrifice assumes that there is divine wrath provoked by sin that is soothed by offerings coupled with an embodiment of their meaning. And let me tell you why I think this is important. I, I understand why people don't like the idea of an angry God. I can understand that. But I've got to warn you about something. If you take away God's wrath, do you realize that you're taking away his love right along with it? Let me explain what I mean. Think with me for a second about what makes you angry. What is it that pushes your buttons? I'll tell you what it is for me. I get angry when something or someone I care about is threatened. Isn't that right? Anger is only possible when you are invested in things. Anger is only possible when you care about things. If you don't care about anything, no one can make you angry. You see what I'm saying? Show me someone who never gets angry and I will show you an apathetic person. Show me a God who never gets angry and I will show you a God who is stoic and who is apathetic. I praise God for his wrath because his wrath is simply the flip side of his love. If you want God to love you passionately, if you want God to be emotionally invested in you, then be prepared for a God who gets angry. Precisely because he is love, passionate love. I'll just be honest with you. Nobody can make me as angry as my wife. And the reason why is because she knows me that well. She knows all my secrets, right? She knows the buttons to push. She, she knows, right? When, isn't it funny that the people that seem to make us the angriest, they're the people we love the most, the people that we're most intimate with, because we're always having to live with them. The friction is always kind of going, isn't it? But that's the way love works, isn't it? We get angry with them precisely because we love them. And anything that threatens the relationship from either side provokes what? Anger. If you want a God who loves you, then you have to accept a God who has wrath. Because let me tell you, the God who revealed himself in the Old Testament and the God who revealed himself in Jesus Christ is not a God without emotion. He's not an apathetic God. He is a God who feels even more deeply and more profoundly than you or I do. And he is angered by sin because sin destroys us. You see, he is angered by sin because it disrupts the communion that he so badly wants to have with us. And he's not going to stand by and say, oh, well, that's a shame. Too bad that didn't work out. 
That's not the God who sent His Son in flesh and blood to bleed and die on a cross so that it could be dealt with. Am I right? Praise God for His wrath. Because His wrath is an indication of His love. Of His deep, passionate love for you and me. And the sacrificial system reminds us that there is something to be grateful for in the wrath of God. He is not stoic, apathetic, but deeply invested in us, emotionally invested in us. And for that reason, he exposes himself to the possibility of being frustrated and angry. But that's, that's because he is a great, great lover. Jealousy. A jealous God. That's right. He wants an exclusive relationship with his people Israel. And when he has to compete with some other paramour for their affections, for some interloper, he gets angry. Let me just, I'll, I'll do one more illustration and then we'll close for this session and we'll finish this up when we get back. But this, this is something that comes to mind often when I, I try to help people see the wrath of God in the Old Testament a little differently. I would say, let me, let me ask you this. If you were a little boy or a little girl and some very bad person were attempting to harm you or abuse you in some way, and your father in the distance were to see it, how would you want your father to react? What would make you feel loved? A father who loves his son or daughter, when he sees his son or daughter about to be harmed by someone, is going to get angry. He'd better get angry. And he's going to fly into action in order to intervene and prevent that from happening. Am I right? You know, in Psalm 18, David describes God responding in just this way when his child is threatened. Uh, he says, he jumped on a cherub and flew. I mean, that's like right out of a Western, isn't it? It's like the cowboy jumps on his horse and then you know, rides to the rescue. That's just how responsive God is to the cries of his children for his love. Now, if that's true of when an enemy would attempt to harm us, how do you respond when your child begins to engage in self-destructive behavior? When a child, for example, takes drugs, a child begins to make foolish decisions, a good parent, a loving parent is going to get mad and is going to respond with some wrath because that wrath is precisely the impetus that scares us away from the thing that is threatening us. Am I right? If it weren't for God's wrath, there are a lot of sins I would have never left behind. God's wrath has taught me to be afraid, not of God, but of the sin and to flee in the other direction. You see? So let's be thankful for God's wrath and for the, the window it is into His love and His passion for you and me, His children. All right, well, I don't know about you, but I'm ready for morning tea. How about it? All right, let's take a break, and then in a few minutes we'll come back and we'll have our second session. Thank you.